right, welcome Alita. I'm delighted to have you here to have this conversation about best practices. And how are you today? I'm awesome, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we'll get started by learning a little bit more about your journey into early education and um, your path to where you are today. Sure. So I uh, graduated college with a elementary ed degree. So when I was teaching kindergarten, my first job um, it was in a Montessori program, and I was seeing how hard all the teachers were working and um, what was happening in the child care piece of, of what I was doing. And I just didn't feel like the teachers were taken care of the way they should have been. They didn't have the supplies they needed. Um, it just felt different than what I thought my, uh, I don't know, my career. Uh, I don't know what I expected when I was that age, but I thought I could, you know, do everything. But um, it wasn't uh, until uh, halfway through my kindergarten year that I just said, I can't do this. And there were many things leading up to it that said that either I go back into ed, um, college and get a different degree, or I do something that makes an impact. And so I started working for one of my moms of the students I taught, and she taught me accounting and business and all kinds of things while she was helping me find a location to open my own school. And so she helped me through that, um, taught me a lot, accounts payable, receivable, taxes, you name it, um, helped me write all my handbooks. She's also an attorney. And um, I just was so excited and um, got my first start. And there I started. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just going for it and I grew very quickly. Um, I went from one location that was very small to ending up uh, 21 years later uh, with four locations. I built two of my buildings and um, and I rented two of my buildings. So wow. yeah. What a yeah. mentor. I mean, what I love about the mentorship, not only were you learning the industry, but business as well, because yeah. as we all yeah. know, Sometimes we come into early education with the love of children and it's further down the road that we realize the importance of all of the accounting best practices, the legal liabilities, all the things that your mentor was um, investing into you. So, yes. And so you had the four schools. Do you still have those four schools? No, I actually sold them. Uh, it will be three years in December and um and I'm currently running my substitute teacher placement company that I opened in 2007. And so that has been um, pretty amazing right now due to all the staffing shortages that we have um, nationwide in every industry. But childcare, uh, I feel like, is taking a, taking a hit with this a little bit stronger for some reason. Um, but I feel like I've been listening to a lot of people. It's been turning around. So that makes me happy. Um, but my sub company here in Minneapolis uh, is is doing very well. Well, and you're the answer, like you said, um, even if it is temporary, but you're the answer to be able to make sure that the classrooms stay open, that the schools are in ratio, and maybe some of those substitutes discover they want their forever home to be with one of the schools that they're subbing yeah. at. So it's a win, win, win. Well, that brings us to our topic. So when we start talking about better business practices, um, in our conversation leading up to this, you you mentioned something about leadership and where that priority might be. So let's kick off with that. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm also a business coach, small business coach. I coach a lot of uh, early child care owners and leaders, as well as uh, women business owners. And I go to a lot of trainings myself and feel like in order for me to be a good leader, I need to continue to learn and grow myself. Uh, I went to a training recently and it said um, 4 million people a month quit their job. And that number was shocking to me. And I just thought, oh my gosh, how are we going to continue to keep these employees that work for us under our company? Um, because I know, you know, the other statistic is one in three child care centers are struggling to still fill 
um, spots, you know, of, of employment and they're continuing to have shortened hours, closing classrooms. And that to me just hurts my heart because it just, I feel like we look back and people are just throwing people at a leadership role to expect them to run a company when they haven't been trained. And so, you know, this training I was at, you know, really uh, looked at um, not looking at the world right now as an unemployment rate, but a workforce participation rate. And that um, sparked my interest. So I did a little bit more of a deep dive on that and realized that we really, you know, need to um, build our leadership at the top. And, it, you know, it's not a work ethic problem, but it's an expectation problem. And what are our leaders putting out there as like drivers of the ship? And what are they doing to make sure that they're keeping their employees and um, not just focusing on who I need to hire, who I need to hire, who I need to hire, but how can I keep, how can I keep, how can I keep my current employees? So, you know, you want the leadership at the top really wants to or should be um, building a meaningful work environment, you know, somewhere where you're constantly giving recognition and building relationships, letting those people come in and build those relationships. I, I hope that these leaders in these um, schools are giving these employees purpose and connection and hope, right? I mean, they're nervous of, of where they're going to work. A lot of them um, didn't work through COVID. And I hate to bring up that COVID word, but, you know, how are they getting back into um, the work environment? And, you know, what does that look like? And what different tools can we give these employees so they have long lasting um, engagement in your company? And, um, you know, it's just, it's so important to build the leadership so they can continue to build it all the way down through the company. And having a purpose. I mean, you talked about several of the priorities. Um, are there other priorities that you would feel, you know, either from a leadership lens or any, any person that's involved in this journey? Yeah, I think, um, you know, leaders in childcare always focus on, the best handbook and the best processes and how many lunches are we making? And every year we have to redo our, um, you know, our parent handbook and what are the rules and regulations? And there are so many things that, that we need to remember and apply and train on. But what I challenge everyone to do is really take a look at building a stay program or a stay method. And what does that look like? It may look different for every one of your employees, but I think right now I challenge everyone out there to take a look at what you're doing. How do you know your employees? What kind of communication that you're building? You know, what kind of training are you offering? We as leaders or directors or owners may think we, we know what they need when in fact they should be coming to you and talking to you with, you know what, I'm struggling here in the classroom uh, with behavior. Is there a training I can take? And you mm -hmm. should have all of that mapped out. Um, maybe you're seeing um, patterns when you're um, communicating them, you know, their, their 30, 60, 90 days or their annual reviews or whatever you may do. Uh, what I would suggest then is you build a training program for that person and set some goals and expectations. Communication is so important at your, you know, when you onboard and when you hit your 30 days and your 60 days and your 90 days and your six months, however it may be, just don't forget about that employee and making sure that you know, you're asking them, how are you really? Like, how are you doing? What do you need from me? Are you stuck? Is there anywhere I can help you? Have these quick conversations because I would hope that your one-year uh, reviews are not something that you look at and say, this is what you're doing wrong. This is what you need to do. I didn't see this. This is what I see in the classroom. But what have you done for the company in the last year? What do you think you're going to do moving forward? Like, what do you need from me? What kind of goals should we set 
for you as an employee? How about you personally? Do you, is there anything I can hold you accountable for? You know, that's the relationship that should be being built from the top down and be that example, you know, show them, tell them what kind of goals that you're setting for the company. Let them know where you are, what's happening, what you need from them. Because if the communication isn't there and those expectations aren't there, it's just not going to be as successful as you want it to be. Right. What I'm hearing you say too, you know, is a, a stay approach to managing your team and Another word for that is retention. And in what ways are you helping the team realize their value? And everybody likes to feel like their opinion matters. So that opportunity to engage to, um, you know, what could we be doing better or differently? What's the most favorite parts of your job? What are some of the, the areas that um, either could be improved? And I think those types of questions, like you were saying, so that that 30, 60, 90, six months, year, it's not did you, did you, did you, did you, it's here yeah. are the right things. And then they have some invested ownership in their success because it was established all along the way in those check-ins that you're talking about. For sure. For sure. Love, love, love that. Um, so let's also talk about it in another conversation we had, I'm hearing a lot about the need to teach customer service. Oh, very much so. Let's very talk much so. About that. Yeah. So I think the other strong piece of um, training that I would um, really recommend that every business or childcare center um, work into their annual, maybe biannual, is customer service training. I mean, I just, the importance of seeing parents or customers, whoever it may be, um, but in this case, childcare, but seeing parents as partners mm -hmm. and a customer and really building that relationship and making sure that your teachers know that, you know, these parents are really what, why you have a job. I mean, this is, this is it. And, and Customer service, if done correctly and taking care of these um, these families and their needs, you know, it just it's going to have them be referral people. I mean, they're going to go out and talk about you. You know, it costs more to bring families into the company than keep them. You know, if you see this pattern that I'm speaking of is is do everything and create a plan to keep your customers, to keep yes. your employees. So here's another, you know, plan, a stay plan. What is the retention? You know, at the end of the day, these are the customers that they're the ones that fund your paycheck. And I think that your employees need to remember that on a biannual basis, because sometimes I think, um, the teachers forget about the importance of customer service and, you know, um, they get maybe challenged with a behavior or challenged with a parent that may say or do something. And then you've got staff running to the broom closet when the parent walks in because they don't want to have anyone <laughs> talk to them about the concerns that they have. Right. So I just, how do you educate your team with good communication skills, with good environment, with good care, with good writing skills? Um, you know, it's it's the real reason your business stays open. It's it's what you can do to continually please or satisfy your customer and your employee, because there's no worse situation when a teacher gets put in a position that they don't know how to get out of. Yes. And there's always going to be that parent that comes in and verbally vomits all over the place. And two days later, she may or he may say they're sorry, but most of the time they don't. And so mm -hmm. how do you handle that? Especially right now when there's so much heaviness in the world and there's so much mental health you know, um, 
you know, fulfilling the family's needs, their expectations. There's a lot that weigh on us. And there's a lot mm-hmm. that weigh on a teacher um, with all of the different expectations of all of the different families, not just this is what I'm going to do in my classroom, but, you know, parent A wants this and parent B wants this and parent C wants something entirely different. So teaching your educators how to best satisfy everyone and to continue to fight for the children's rights and mental health and wellness and education and the best care that like over the entire time that they're in that classroom, like best satisfies their needs. Right. And when I think of customer service, um, I had to laugh when you say they run to the broom closet because we um, tend to be conflict averse community where we don't like to have the conflicts. But I think another aspect of customer service is getting to know your families, getting to know <laughs> little things that you pick up during the day where you're building those relationships, birthdays, anniversaries, you know, that side of the customer service coin. Do you have some thoughts about how you've seen that done well or um, how that balances those difficult conversations or what impact it might have on a future difficult conversation? Uh, Yeah, so we, um, that's the partnership that I always talk about. And creating this partnership where you're both on the same page, you may not always teach or care or run the classroom exactly how every family needs, but always having clear expectations to them of what your intention is and your why. And then the parents will understand a little bit more. Um, I can remember parents coming in, you know, constantly asking, why do I not see the same teacher at the end of the day that I do at the beginning of the day? Right. And I say, well, our hours are 12 hours a day. I said, that's when we're open. I said, would your work ever expect you to work 12 hours every single day? And they're like, oh, I guess I didn't think of that. I said, your child's here 11 hours of those 12 hours a day. I would never want a teacher. And then they understood. So whenever you can explain your why or explain across the board the best practices that you have or or why you're doing what you're doing, the parents understand a little bit more. And what what strengthened our relationships and our partnerships in our schools is the fact that we did have parent um, boards. And it was it was not the fact that they ran the board, they didn't run the school, but it was like an advisory board. So we had it every quarter and the start of our meetings, we talked about everything that happened in the past quarter, what's coming up in the upcoming quarter. If I was struggling with anything like raising tuition rates or different rules that I had to put in place, um, or even the fact that, okay, rule three, our Minnesota rules of licensing are changing and this is what it's going to be. How would you effectively roll this out um, as a business, but understanding, you know, from a parent point of view, what would, what would make you feel good about reading this? And so every time I needed anything or wanted to run something by, I, you know, worked with my parent advisor board and they helped me um, run the school. I mean, they helped me with all my processes. So it it was good to feel like um, I could see it from a parent's point of view because I don't know everything. I never will. But I wanted to do things this way and they would bring their message to me. And I'm like, oh, yeah. OK, I'm not going to say it like this anymore. And so they helped me create a better environment where we really were creating um, that good relationship and that good partnership. And that helped them build more trust with my teachers as well. That's brilliant because I don't see many um, advisory board within early education. I see them in other businesses, of course, but I mean, it's an essential part Uh, for those that might want to explore that for their own schools. How many parents or um, how many would you typically put on an advisory board? So we usually had someone that took notes and was able to, um, send the notes out to all the families. We had one uh, parent from every classroom minimum. I mean, we didn't always have any more than 10 
parents in there. You know, we had one that was the community voice. So they were always on social media. And so they would, if needed be any recommendations or referrals or anything that may have come up, you know, you've always got the one mom that will reach out and say, my child care does this, this, and this. What do your child care centers do? And, and then it comes down to it's the center. So um, I had, I had my social media or community partner there. And so um, I would just say, you know, whatever feels good, um, you know, they're going to change because they're going to grow out of your school. So you're always going to make sure everyone knows that they're welcome. Heck, if you had 20 people come, it's 20 pieces of support and 20 ways that you're going to learn how to run your company. Um, you cannot, you have to be a good moderator because yes, it could turn say. into a a big session of yeah. complaints or comments or do it my way or do it their way. But, you know, the rules were pretty clear. This wasn't about, you know, anything that just because you said it, it's going to happen. But we're going to take everyone's advice, everyone's communication, every situation that we talk about, and we're going to learn how to make it better. And um, and it just really was never a problem. Yeah. Well, you said the key word, which was there were some rules behind the purpose Very much of the so. board. And it doesn't mean that we're going to do all of those things. We're going to take it under advisement. Um, but ultimately, as a business owner, you have to weigh all of the input that gets executed. So that's a great takeaway. Um, yeah. We had also a conversation around the five senses. We know what they are generally, but let's talk about it uh, the way you describe it in the early education setting. Sure, sure. So um, what I always try and help guide leaders is to take a step back from being inside of your desk all the time and put yourself in the parent's shoes. Mm -hmm. So when you drive into your parking lot, what does it look like? What right. do you see? What do you hear? Is the playground messy? Is it is there garbage bags out there? Is there broken toys sitting there waiting to be this, you know, put in the garbage or gotten rid of? Um, is is the front door a big mess? Is there paper all over? Is there a clear sign where the front door is? You know, that is the parking, you know, marked well. So as a parent, for me coming into your parking lot, what am I going to see? And then I always say, take a step back and be that parent and walk through that front door. What do you hear? Is it a lot of babies crying? Is there teachers yelling? Are there are there chaotic hallways? Again, is there paperwork all over you? You don't know where to look. What What are you seeing? What are you hearing? And then the big thing in childcare is what are you smelling? Um, does it smell good or is it just dirty diapers or bad food? And so I want I want leaders to do this once a month to really take a look at, you know, how they can give that customer service experience from the first time they drive through that driveway and walk in that door. And then what do you do? Like when you give a tour, do you just greet them at the door and do you um, start the tour right there? Do you bring them into an area where you can sit down, whether it be your office or a front area, ask them what what they're looking for in childcare, what their needs are. Because at the end of the day, if their expectations don't even match your core values, you have to stop that right away. And we're at a point where there's so many families needing childcare. You get to let those families know this is not the right care for you, or yes, we can take care of you. So the the compassion and the empathy and the pregnant mom that is had three tours earlier and you're the only one that's sitting her down and really listening to her and giving her a bottle of water. What are they feeling? What are they sensing? What is their gut telling them? Um, and then walking down the hallways, what is the feel? You know, are you only touring the classroom that they want to be in? Or are you giving them the tour of the entire school? You should always give the tour of the entire school because they may have another child. They may have a neighbor that's looking for childcare. They can speak all of it, right? And so 
are the children running up to the directors? How does that make them feel? Are they giving them hugs? Do they know them by name? Are the teachers smiling? What do they see in the classroom? What do they hear? What do they smell? Um, all of these five senses are so important for you to really take a look at as you are providing an environment, not only for your new families, but your families that have been with you. They expect that you are going to give them the service and the um, the promises that you toured them when they first started. So if if the phone's ringing and nobody's answering it, that's bad, right? And so if nobody looks at you when you come on a tour, that doesn't feel good. You know, are the children happy? Or are they crying? You know, are the teachers engaged? Um, do the teachers come over and say hello to the the families and introduce themselves to new ones or say hello to the ones that are coming in to pick up their children or drop off? And so I just... Another challenge I always have is just really switch roles between you as the director and leader and you as the customer and see what you can do better. See how you can strengthen that because there's always room for improvement. And, you know, when you take the time and look back and be that customer and see um, see what that looks like is it's it's an important you know, addition to your walkthroughs. Um, the other thing that I always tell directors um, that teachers should do uh, probably quarterly is um, go into each other's room and themselves in their own room and sit on the floor. Look at the eyes through the child's view. What are they seeing? What's on that level? Because we're always looking down on everything. But have you ever sat and done a full turn on your knees or sitting on the floor, what do you see? Document what what needs fixing, what looks wonky, you know, figure it out. And if you invite other educators into your classroom, maybe the preschool teacher into the infant room, infant room into the toddler room, it's this new set of eyes that can ask questions, give you compliments, ask about some challenges that they may see. And maybe the one rearrangement that a teacher suggests is the best thing that now the toddlers aren't running all crazy exactly. and wanting to bite someone because you're in that room all the time. And it's just a different view of, of what you see. So have your teachers be the customer, the child, uh, right. and, and review their classroom um, and other teachers review each other's classrooms. It's so important. That is very valuable because it also can help with behavior. Like you said, you, you kind of skipped okay. over that, but you know, when we kind of look at the environment for learning, there could be something that's provoking without intending to either a behavior sure. or an energy level that, wow, if we just make this small change, it brings a calmness yes. um, to the environment and um, a place where they can learn, where they feel safe. And the other thing that you said that speaks back to the culture and sense of belonging is it, it takes courage to let somebody come in and look at your view, look at your classroom. But if it's a culture that says this is so that we can, you know, if we have any blind spots, because we all have them, we all have them in other well, areas. For sure, that is a, a great way to build that that teamwork as well for the stay. Yeah, starts with leadership, of course. Here we go back again with the leadership. If your leadership is welcoming to feedback or connections or the surveys that they put out and they're not going, why are they saying this or what's happening? And I can't, we don't do that. But if they're like, okay, this is what's being said and look for patterns and things that they can make better and they announce this is the feedback we were getting. This is why we're going to do this. This is how we're going to change it. These employees will always see what the leader is doing. You know, I always say speed of the leader, speed of the team. And so, you know, if you build the culture, if you build that environment, if you're showing them it's okay to receive feedback and act on it in a positive way for better outcomes, you're not going to have any challenges whatsoever. Right. 
I want to circle back just with a quick anecdote about um, the tour and what do you see? What are you hearing? What do you smell? Um, this what happened to be a new school that was opening up in a neighborhood um, that was in desperate need of childcare. But what here's what happened was there was an open house and it was almost like this small little group got together to make sure they got in before anybody else. They literally created a um, Facebook group. First parent went for the tour and like, okay, quick, get on the schedule, get on the schedule. It was almost like, let's get there first before anybody else. So to your point, good news travels fast, bad news travels even faster. They weren't posting on their main page. They had a separate group so that their besties could get into this school. So I can't emphasize that enough, what you were just saying about what are you seeing from the parking lot all the way through the, the whole experience and, and qualifying them. It's okay to qualify them out if they're not a good fit for your school. Well, and here's the thing on the opposite side of that. I agree with you 100%. They also open Facebook pages just so they can complain. I and know. so when you have someone that is on the inside that can see something like that, that can be a voice for you, you can bring some of those people in and invite them in and really get down to it and and communicate, you know, what you're hearing or what you're seeing and and what's being said on the outside. Call out the elephant in the room. I mean, I had to do that many, many years ago. And um, we had an entire neighborhood. One person said one thing, which fueled and fueled and fueled. And so I welcomed them in and they all came in. And I said, this is what's happening. This is what was said. I would love to talk about this. At the end of the day, they all, every one of them apologized to me because they didn't know, they didn't ask. They just, it just fed off of each other's information. So when you open the door again to strong communication or, hey, this is going on, you know, let's talk about it. It, it may stink. I mean, your heart may, because you're so proud of your business, your heart may be hurt a little bit, but you have to follow that pride and have a really strong customer service and, and be able to welcome anyone in good or challenging behavior or conversations, because that's, that's, what's going to grow you and your business and your company. And it just, it goes back to communication and strength and what do they need and really creating that bond and partnership. Agreed. And um, the reputation, like you said, yeah. you were able to swallow your pride and you were made aware of this little subgroup. Um, yes. And half the time they're uninformed because half truths yeah. get shared, uh, shared from time to time. So great input on that. So let's shift gears a little bit. What are you seeing some of the challenges that are coming our way over the next several years or year? Yeah. So I, I've got two big ones that I'm I'm researching a lot. Um, one of them is the technological impact of development of the children. I, you know, I feel like screen time right now is um, easy for parents who are very, very busy and they just, um, I see strollers running around the malls with iPads in them and the baby isn't even like can't even see barely. <laughs> and I just, I'm so worried about the growth of the brain and the mind and the reading skills of, you know, left and right brain, the crawling and the, just every piece of development. Um, and I just, I want to make sure that these parents um, are educated and they have an opportunity to um, be supported by us as, you know, we know what's going on. We have proof this is what happens. And we, a lot of parents don't know that that's all they know how to do. And so how to educate them to interact or how to not always put technology in front of a child at any age, whether it's infant or 10, right? And so, you know, just having the resources to educate families um, is is really important. And what kind of um, trainings can you have at your schools or you can have available to them? Maybe colleges have this training and you make them aware of it or 
or you go to the training yourself and then you um, communicate it to the, to the families. It's just, it's so important to um, teach these uh, families, especially the young families that have never had a child before. They don't know. They just don't know. We, I want everyone to know that if you are an educator and you own a child care center, you're a leader of a child care center, you're a teacher, you are considered the expert. That's why you are in the position you're in. And they rely on you for the information to help build a strong foundation for that child. And you want to make sure they have every single thing in place before they head off to elementary school. So, um, you know, it, that's important. And then the other, um, the other piece I think is the mental health of the children. Um, and okay, I guess the parents and our educators, right? So the parents are taking more on as employment they're more stressed out at home. The children are put in front of screens or maybe don't even get spoken to. Then you bring them to childcare. The mom and dad are tired. The teacher gets downloaded on. We're not living up to their expectations. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of mental health there. So breaking it up into maybe three sections of, what can we do for who and when and where and create that plan and have opportunities. Um, I know I work with some childcare centers that have actually hired um, a social worker on site and they are there for the families. They're there for the children, the staff. I mean, and now the insurance plans out there have resources that you can call if you need anything. I mean, maybe you, we just don't know what goes on in everyone's lives. And, you know, maybe this employee is late two minutes every day and you write them up and you're like threatening to fire them. And you just don't understand that she's just trying to keep her baby safe from maybe a, a abusive husband or a work environment. I don't know, whatever it is, we just have to have compassion and empathy and communication and let them know that, you're building an area of trust for these these people to work in, to bring their children, to um, have faith in them. And, you know, I just, it's not like times before. I just, it's, it's, I think we, we got to wrap our brains around this and really get some help in these areas. A lot of people are worried about, you know, what grant is going to come or how the parents can't afford childcare or all this stuff. Well, let's start a little bit further back and create an amazing environment for childcare and everything else will fall into place. Communicate and educate. There it is again. Yep. And making those resources available. Those are great yeah. insights because I, I had not heard those as um, in particular, the, the pervasive use of technology at younger and younger and younger ages, but we, yeah. we can see that the impact is, for sure, and having communication skills is um, is lost when it's communicating with a screen. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, as we wrap up, you have like a quote or a favorite motto that you yeah. like to share? Yeah, absolutely. I have so many, but the one that I always uh, talk about is about um, ideas and intentions do not change people. Behavior is what helps you grow, and you know, when you lead by example, instead of talking at people all the time and you're showing, not telling, you know, you're learning and applying. And that's the only way that you can make things happen. You know, I, I already referenced be the leader, speed of the team. And I think it's really important for you to be a strong leader and show them what you have and what you can do. And, um, you know, it's one thing I see people going to conferences all the time and learning all this stuff and taking all these notes and they close that notebook and then they go home and they don't do anything with that information. And, you know, you may as well not go, you know, just you can learn and you can take it all in, but until you apply it, you will never, ever, ever get anywhere of growth with your yourself or your company. So. I've heard you say that before, knowing you run these mastermind groups, and I've heard you speak about 
if you're not going to execute, don't come. But if you're going to come, you're going to be expected to execute and share um, so that you can grow and really come away with something that's not inside of a notebook, but is inside <laughs> of your your best practice, best yes. practice, practice, the things that we've been talking about today. Yes. Well, thank you again, Alita. This was um, a pleasure to talk with you and to hear your expertise on these important topics. And I'm sure we'll have future thank conversations. You. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you.